good evening. I'm, I'm well aware that the Bruins game is on. Last week I was doing this and the same thing happened, so I'm not sure how this has worked out, but I am well aware, so I'm going to try to get through as quickly as possible so you can move along your way. And then I will stay for questions for those of you who have questions, those of you who want to get to the Bruins game, I completely understand. Uh, my name is Anne Marie Banfield. I'm the Education Liaison for Cornerstone Action and Cornerstone Policy Research. Cornerstone Policy Research is kind of a family policy advocacy group in New Hampshire, and I do the education part for Cornerstone. Um, I am a volunteer. I am a mom. Uh, probably about, well, I have, my oldest son is 21, and when he was starting kindergarten, as a mom, I started looking at schools. I went to public schools my whole life. Um, I noticed when I got to college, I thought, wow, these kids who went to private school, they know so much more than me. And I, and I got a pretty decent education. So at that time, I thought, you know, I'm going to really start researching education um, in order to make good decisions for my kids. And that's what I did. And, and that's about the time the internet came into existence for anybody who's young over <laughs> there. Um, and I started connecting with people around the country. And what I found out from researching education, there is um, a lot of reformers out there that want to reform education, and they could care less if it makes your child smarter. That wasn't my goal. My goal was how, whenever somebody comes up with something, some idea, reform, how does this make the child smarter? How does this actually educate the child? And what I found was a lot of people out there who want to reform education could care less about that. So when I started making connections with people, experts, as, as I would refer to them, I always made sure that that was their primary goal. Um, not that, there's, that other things are not important, but that was my main focus. So that's, what I, that's how I started. And I started connecting with, with experts around the country, professors in colleges that were getting these kids in, and they didn't know math facts. They didn't know grammar. They didn't know set, sentence structure. And I wanted to avoid that with my kids. So I kind of started this really for my own personal reasons. I lived in Ohio at the time, then we moved to Kentucky, and then we moved to New Hampshire. And when I got up here, um, you know, I, I had made a lot of connections and I had an email list set up. So I started emailing parents, you know, here's information I got. You might like this. This might be good information for you to share with your um, spouse and make good decisions for your kids. So that's, I just wanted you to know about me, why I do this. I do this, I get paid nothing, I, do, I volunteer because I believe it's the right thing to do. Okay? So I, I think it's important because I went to a, a school board meeting in Manchester and I spoke to the school board meeting and um, some, some gentleman got up after me and said, you know, she's a lobbyist, you know, kind of thing. And I thought, well, wait a second, I think you should know more about me. Yes, I do lobby. I do lobby on behalf of some legislation that I believe will benefit a student or could possibly not be good for, for the school. So I do that uh, for Cornerstone um, when, I, you know, when, I, when I feel comfortable doing it, when I think it's you know, worth my time. Um, Common Core, what is it? That's the question that everybody seems to be asking. Uh, it's kind of like answering Obamacare, what is it? It's really difficult to do. It's not easy. It's not just a set of standards. I wish it were just a set of standards, then I could focus on one little thing and, and be done with it. It's not. Uh, Common Core is really an entire redesign of our public education system. And we're seeing it in New Hampshire, because New Hampshire is really the one that's implementing so much of what President Obama, in his, one of his um, speeches, said, we're redesigning public education. This started in New Hampshire a couple years ago, and so we've already started it. You're already, it's already in, in the schools. Um, so when I talk about Common Core, I will talk about it in a broad perspective. It, it encompasses many different components. There are standards. There are standards, and I'll talk about that. But there's other components to this redesigning of schools, competency-based education. Um, part of Common Core requires data collection and data mining. I'm going to get to all of this. But understand, when I say Common Core, I'm talking about the whole picture. And I think a lot of people think that it's just about the standards. And I will talk about the standards, but it's, it's, it's far more. It's a redesigning of public education. If you know anything about the European public education, that's, that's kind of the direction we're heading. Um, so it's redesigning education. And I'm going to talk about the standards first, because there are academic standards. And under No Child Left Behind, each state had their set of standards. And under Common Core, it's one big national for the nation. 
um, New Hampshire did adopt the English and the math. So right now we have English and math standards in our school, Common Core. Uh, science will be, science has actually been released. We haven't adopted them yet. And I'm hoping to put the brakes on that <laughs> because this kind of slid in with nobody noticing. Um, I think there's a couple states that have adopted the science standards. The English and the math standards. Remember I told you that I connect with a lot of experts around the country. Uh, for, for several years I've been on this, what I call a math loop. And it's, it's, um, it's set up with professors from around the country in different, uh, different colleges. And for years, you know, I've been talking to them and getting their, their knowledge about what they're seeing coming into colleges. And, and, you know, different political backgrounds, different backgrounds. The focus was math education. But in, in addition to that, I was on this loop. There were other people. Um, English professor was on this loop. And for Common Core, they needed a validation committee. Okay, so they set up the standards. But they needed a validation committee to validate them. It's kind of like if you um, put a, a heating system in your house, and then you go hire somebody and you say, you know, tell me if this heating system is good or not. That's what the validation committee basically did. And so years ago, because this has been in existence for a few years now, I found out that the two individuals chosen to sit on the English and the math validation committee were on my, were on my loop. So I had direct access to them. So as they were going through the standards, developing the standards, all of this, I was following this through them. They were telling, you know, they were telling us what was going on. One thing I noticed was the lack of transparency right off the bat. They couldn't get information. They couldn't get information who was sitting on the standards, who were, who were developing these standards. These were, this was a math professor and this was an English, English professor. The math professor is James Milgram. He's out of um, Stanford University. And Sandra Stotsky, who uh, used to sit on the Board of Education in Massachusetts. She helped develop Massachusetts standards. They were the best in the country. And so, and so Professor Milgram and, and Sandra Stosky both sat on the validation committee. They were the only content experts, by the way. So there's a committee, math, committee of English. On the math committee was Professor Milgram, only math, mathematician on that committee. Sandra Stosky, only English professor on that committee. Both, by the time they were done and they looked at the final version, both refused to sign off on them. Both of them said, these are not worthy of being in your public schools. And yet they are. And yet nobody knows this. So it, it, the nice thing was I had access to, I, these people are of the utmost integrity. They looked at, they are, they're looking at it strictly from an English and a math perspective, nothing else. And they go through the standards and they look at them. And they ha have critiqued them. <clears throat> and you can find their critiques on the internet. I have access to them very easily. You can read their critiques. Um, I'm going to give you some examples. For instance, um, Professor Stotsky said that, the, uh, that they are chief empty skills and reduces the study of classical literature in favor of informational texts. So what you're going to see is you're going to see the schools moving away from the fiction and the classics to more informational kind of type of reading for the students. And as they get older, it's more and more and more. Okay, as they're younger, they're, they're reading maybe a little bit more stories. But as they get older, it's like 50% by the time they get to high school. Informational texts. Um, what's an example of an informational text? Well, I decided, I got a call a couple weeks ago from a, from a lady, and she wanted to go into her district, and it's in New Hampshire. And she said, Anne Marie, I've got um, an appointment set up with the principal at the school. And if I said the school, you would, you would recognize it. But I'm not going to say the school because I can tell you this is going on in every school. And if I say the school, I'm afraid everybody's going to focus on the school and say, oh, this isn't happening in my district. It is. Okay. Um, so we went into the school, sat down with the principal for about an hour, and we looked at, they had just purchased English Common Core textbook and math. Okay. Now, I recognize the math. It's everyday math, one of the absolute worst programs you can have in your school. Absolute worst. I'm a math tutor, and that's why you have to pay math tutors, because you, your school board and your administrators decided to bring in everyday math, one of the worst. So I didn't need to look at that. But he brought in the English textbooks. 
and I started flipping through them. And so I'm looking at, you know, what do they mean by these informational, informational things? And there's stories. This was, I think, fourth or fifth grade. And as I'm flipping and I see, okay, well, it's a story on the solar system. Okay, I could see that. You know, it's not really a, in some, there was a couple fictional stories in there. And then as I flip it, I see a story about Cesar Chavez, who was a big into the labor movement, pro-labor, pro-union. Okay, so now I see a political figure, a, a, a big political figure in here. And then as we're flipping through it, we notice that there's another page about um, a boy who wanted to, who, who was concerned that there were no helmet laws for kids who were riding bikes, and he wanted to organize the community and start passing some laws. So you've got fourth and fifth graders, and that's one of the criticisms that have been lodged against these English standards, is that, you know, as you're moving towards these informational kind of materials, you know, you're going to start, that they're starting to see this political message within this, within this context. And sure enough, that's what we saw. That's exactly what we saw. Plenty of stories that, you know, and nobody would be bothered by, but sure enough, they, they plopped in a couple, you know, just planting those little seeds. And so it, re, it basically affirmed to me that, yes, this is what's going on. In the back, there's an appendix, very small appendix on grammar. Almost no grammar instruction. One of the fundamental key things that these kids need to be learning, one of the key things that they're not learning is grammar and sentence structure. But we're going to have them reading all these stories and writing, and I'm not sure how they're going to develop skills to write without a more comprehensive approach to, to grammar instruction. And I think that's one of the big, big problems that the English, the, these English professors and these, the teachers that have been teaching English will tell you that, you know, we're not getting to the heart of the problem. Um, Professor Milgram, he states that it's almost a joke to think students who follow the standards will be ready to enter and be prepared for a university. By the end of fifth grade, the material being covered in arithmetic and algebra is more than a year behind the early year grade expectations in most high achieving countries. By the end of seventh grade, they are two years behind. In other words, the longer your kids stay in a public school following Common Core, the further behind they're going to fall with, compared to their international peers. Okay? And I'll give you an example. California had some of the best math standards. I know the people who developed them when they were in California. Their standards had children, you know, if you started in school, your children were ready for Algebra 1 by 8th grade. That was like, and I can tell you, that's still behind. That's still behind your international peers. But that was, you know, okay, let's get them to eighth grade algebra one. Now it's ninth grade. So actually when California adopted Common Core, they dumbed down their standards. They actually lowered their standards. California lowered their standards. There was money being offered. It's always about the money. Um, interestingly enough, the Secretary of Education came to New Hampshire a couple years ago, and um, <clears throat> he came to a school in Manchester. And I got up that morning, and I thought, you know, should I stop in? And I thought, no, i got to take my kids. Pulled the hair up in ponytail, put my flip-flops on, took my kids to school, and decided to pop it. So I walked in, you know, and I just looked, looked like this mom coming in, and I sit down, and, you know, he's there, and he's talking to the teachers and things, and kind of gets up, and he was pretty much done. He was kind of walking around, and I walked right up to him, and I said, well, how do you reconcile Massachusetts and California lowering their standards for Common Core? He just kind of looked at me like, who is this mom with this ponytail who didn't even shower? And, you know, she's in here, you know. But he had no explanation for it. Could, I mean, how do you explain it? How do you explain it? But that's the reality of it. Um, so, so essentially you have what you had. Would you find some states that actually raise their standards? Probably. But now you have all these states having to fund and, and replace their materials to go a level up instead of, you know, let's, let's, put the, let's put the standards up here and let's, you know, shoot for the top. Now, you know, a couple years, who knows, maybe we'll do this again and maybe we'll not have to spend another billion dollars. So that's, so that's one of the big problems is the standards themselves. The, the experts on the validation committee said they're not worth having in our schools and we have them. Um, one of the big contentions with uh, Common Core is the data collection on the students and their families and the teachers. OK? 
okay? So they're not going to escape this either. And you might say, well, you know, there's privacy protection laws in place. Not anymore, because under President Obama, that's gone. He rewrote the rules, FERPA laws, okay? So FERPA laws used to protect student privacy. Not anymore. They rewrote them. So this information can go out to anybody, anywhere. And the good thing about the NSA and the IRS scandal, now you know what it can do. Now you know exactly how that can be damaging. So yes, this information can be shared. How are they going to collect it? The assessments your kids are taking in, in the schools. The new assessment starts next year. It's called the Smarter Balanced Assessment. So, you're going to, so your kids are going to be filling that out. You thought that this was just a test on math and English. Oh no, that's how they're, they've been collecting information. The, the thing about it is it wasn't allowed to go, it wasn't being shared, it wasn't being distributed. Now it can be. It can be sent to other departments within the government. The Department of Labor, for instance. So as your child goes through, through life, if they make mistakes in school, it gets shared with the Department of Labor. Well, who's to say that when they go to apply for a job down the road, maybe a, maybe a paper they wrote in school that's controversial, now maybe their employer gets to, to look at this information. These are the concerns that everybody's having. Has that happened yet? Not that I'm aware of. But these are the concerns that people have, and I believe they are absolutely legitimate. And this is pre-K through college. If your kids are in a, in a public college, they're being tracked. That data is being collected. Because a couple years ago, they came to the New Hampshire legislature and expanded it. It used to be K through 12. Now it's pre-K through college. So this information is going out and going to be collected on these students and can go anywhere, anywhere. Um, so that's a, that's a big concern. It's so much of a concern that states like um, New York, where the assessments have already started, they've already started legislation. They, you know, the, the, I have, I'm, I'm in contact with people who are writing the legislation up there. They've already sent it to me, so I've got a sample piece of what they've already introduced into the legislature. And I've already sent it to legislators saying, copy it, I don't care what you do, do something. We need the same kind of protections. So New York is in the process of trying to pass legislation that protects student privacy. I was told um, tonight that there's two members of the um, House Education Committee that are working on that right now. One's a Democrat, one's a Republican. This is not a partisan issue. This is not a partisan issue. This is being brought in bipartisan, and it can be taken out bipartisan. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't want to, to make it sound like it's, it's just Obama. You have Republican governors who signed on to this, who are defending this. Jeb Bush is going around the country telling us how great this is. So please understand that you, Republican governors that have signed on to this. And I think probably, maybe, you know, in the beginning, they needed the money so bad, and hey, national standards, how bad can they be? Not realizing this was in the planning stage years ago. I knew this was coming 10 years ago, but if I'd have gotten up here and told you, you would have said, oh, she's a conspiracy theorist. No, I knew this was coming. They tried this during the Clinton administration, but the Republicans said no at that time. So this was something, and it was planned before the Clinton administration, okay? So this was tried during the Clinton administration and kind of, you know, we had no child left behind, but that really kind of paved the way for this. This has really been something, okay, well, no child, you know, it's kind of like um, Harry Brown once said, the government will break your leg and then hand you a crutch and say, see, I fixed it. So no child left behind kind of broke the system and now they're going to kind of fix it. So data collection is very important. We're looking at it. Um, there's still information that's coming about. So I don't have every detail on it, but that is something, that, that's one of those areas that I'm still learning, you know, what's going on with that. Um, there is a, um, there's a data point system. It's, it's, there's 400 data points, you know, that, that you can look at that they're trying, like your religious affiliation, your political affiliation, where your kids are being picked up at the bus stop. That was listed on there all kinds of information. Um, how did this get into the states? Through race to the top grants. Um, so in the beginning, in the very beginning when the economy collapsed, take advantage of it, you know, states that were desperate for money. And here's Bill Gates, who is the money behind this, dangling money out there in the race to the top grant saying, if you just do this, 
we'll give, you know, you might qualify for this money, Race to the Top grants, if you adopt Common Core standards, if you evaluate teachers based on the test, if you implement this data collection system, um, you might get some money. New Hampshire hasn't received a dime. This is all going to fall on the local taxpayer because the state's not funding this. But it was the state that decided to adopt Common Core. Four people on the Board of Education voted this in for us. They are not elected. They are appointed board members on the State Board of Education. One voted against it, John Lyons. So we have four appointed by the former governor sitting on the Board of Education that voted it in for every school and every child in, this, in the state. This is not coming from the people because the legislature has never voted on this. So your school boards have never voted on it, which if I were a sitting school board member, I would be saying, why are we not voting on this? This should, this should be a vote by your school board. And I don't know of one school board that's voted on this. The school board oversees your school. They need to exercise their power. And it's amazing how, ma how many times they don't. Um, so that's how it came in. Um, what does this cost? What is this going to cost the state of New Hampshire, the schools, your district? Your guess is as good as mine. I have gone before the Board of Education and I've said, how much is this costing? I know legislators have asked. I know individuals have gone before the Board of Education. They have never answered that question. Other states have come up with estimates. Uh, I've seen estimates anywhere from 289 per student to 404 per student. And the, the last one, the 404, that estimate came in by an individual who sent that to our Commissioner of Education. He has done a complete analysis of all the states and came up with how much this is going to cost each state. And he came up with 404 and sent that to the, to the Commissioner of Education. I still have yet for the Commissioner of Education to tell us what this is costing. Would they know the exact amount? Clearly not. You know, it's going to vary from school to school. It depends on how, ma how many computers you have in your school because this test pretty much is required to be taken on a, on a, on a computer. So you have, to be com you, know, you have to have your school with all the computers. Some schools have that already in place. Some schools may need to upgrade their equipment. Some schools may need all brand new equipment. So that can vary. But think, you know, think about how many kids you have in your district. You multiply that by anywhere from $300 to $400 per student. That's the cost estimate. Now, they will tell you that, well, you know, we replace these books periodically and we do teacher training and, you know, we do this anyway. But Common Core is driving this and it, you, they need to be honest with you and tell you, okay, we are, we're switching out this book, this textbook, because of Common Core. That is a cost directly associated with Common Core, whether, you know, they want to call it that or not. Let's be honest about it. Um, one of the things I brought up was the teacher evaluation, because this is very, very important. <clears throat> New Hampshire's doing it a little differently, actually better than what some states did. Some states right off the bat, boom, passed legislation that the teacher's evaluation is going to be tied to this new national assessment. This is not a good idea, and I'm going to explain why. Um, first of all, your teachers don't have a whole lot of autonomy in their classroom. They're told what to use, and they're told how to teach it. Okay. So if something goes wrong, they've been, told, they've been given this textbook, and I can tell you there's a whole lot of lousy textbooks out there. As a math tutor, I can tell you, I look at some of these math textbooks, everyday math. If an administrator brought that math program to me and said, I'm going to be responsible now for how the kids do on this test, I, I would leave that profession. That's how upset I would be, because you can't, you can't teach out of that textbook. That's a, that's a joke. Um, so, th so now they're going to be evaluated to this new national test. Um, Professor Milgram, I brought up earlier, said on the math validation committee, refused to sign off on the standards. He has a, a PDF file, I downloaded it recently, and he has gone through all the sample questions of this new test coming out, this new math test. Big problems with the new math test. He's found tons of flaws with the new math test. Not only that, then there's another professor out of um, Johns Hopkins, another, uh, he, he analyzes the standards for Fordham Institute, somebody who is on my math loop. So I went directly to him and I said, you know, what do you think of this new math test? He, he put out a, an article, you can find it. Too much focus on communication skills. I'm a math tutor. 
I'm not sure what you're communicating on a math test. I, re I ask a student, show me your work, show me the steps you take, that's it. I don't need to know why 2 plus 2 equals 4. I just need to know, see your work. Communication is a big part of this new test, and that's what they're saying. Too much. There's too much of a focus. So explain your answer. I'm a math tutor. These guys are mathematicians. They're scratching their head going, you're kidding. We need to know they know the math, okay? That's what your child needs to know. If they can't explain it, and I can tell you, I, I, I sit with kids all the time. I can't even imagine asking them to explain this problem or explain, just get the answer right. I'm sorry, but you know, I, I check with the experts. They're, this is what they're saying. I, me as, and I'm not a mathematician, but I check with them. It, you know, am, I, am I right about this? Absolutely right, because you don't need to, communication is not a big part of math, mathematics. And that's what they're saying. So going back to the teacher evaluation, your kid's taking this, this math proficiency test. And now the kids, the, the scores, because they're already giving these tests in other states right now, the scores are plummeting. Is it because your child didn't know how to communicate 2 plus 2 equals 4? Or is it because they don't know that 2 plus 2 equals 4? You can have parents looking at this assessment thinking, okay, my child's not proficient. You're going to have schools now evaluating a teacher. Is this really an evaluation of their math computation skills or because they can't communicate it well? Or because there's so many problems with the math questions? And that's what they're saying. They're seeing flaws with the math questions. So much so that you know, they're giving the tests up in New York right now that I think it was like 40 principals sign this big letter, say, we've got a problem with these tests. Listen to them. This is, this is the problem. I don't know if they've read the critiques about the test, but they're raising the red flags. We've got serious problems. That's why. So when your school board is looking to evaluate teachers, because this is all part of the package, you've got to now start evaluating these teachers, look at how, tell them, no, we don't want our teachers tied, evaluation tied to this test. It's flawed, we know there's a problem with it. Until you have an absolute perfect test and you're allowing these teachers to use good materials in their classroom, then why are we evaluating them to this test? And I'm not opposed to teacher evaluations at all. I think everybody should be evaluated. It has to be fair. It has to be right. And the unions have called for a moratorium. They're right. They're right about this. It, it, there needs to be a moratorium because what they're doing is, somebody said, um, no child left behind went from an attack on schools to common core is an attack on teachers. I've been reading this on Twitter and people keep Twittering this. That's why, that's why they say that. So keep that in mind. Um, uh, I wanna touch on competencies because this is in the high schools right now and, and they're talking about bringing it into the K through eight. I'm gonna, kind of get through it pretty quick. When I said they were redesigning schools, what I meant by that is what we're very used to is about to change, and it's changing. So now we're now a competency-based education system. Competency-based education is outcome-based education. Outcome-based education is mastery learning. You notice how the names change? Oh, in Maine it's called standards-based education. Notice how the names change? And, and Common Core is now being called college and career readiness. See how the names change? Because as it fails in certain states, or as it becomes a bad name, they change the name to kind of throw you off. So we went from mastery learning, which was a, a, a failure. So we went to outcome-based education, and now we're in competency-based education. Because see, if you go search the internet for competency-based education, you may not trace it back to outcome-based education. And um, so you, we've got outcome-based education in our schools, and that's what I refer to it, because that's really what it is. Um, The entire redesign effort is to start a tracking system. Track your children to career or track your children to college. So you're gonna start seeing surveys coming home about where your kids are good at. You know, what, what, they're, what they're kind of good, kind of like um, personality tests, that kind of thing. What, what, what your child be good at. The state's gonna figure that out for you. Um, I had a parent, uh, I, I, or I heard from a parent in New Ham or Nashua, who's, I think it was her son, took one of these surveys in high school and her son's gonna be a rapper. She was not happy about that. <laughs> That's what the survey came back. 
So you, you know, I, I don't know how many you could, I don't know how you can tell a child at the age of eight what they're going to be good at. I mean, I remember I was going to be a vet. You know, I loved animals, so I was going to be a vet when I was a little kid. I mean, I can't even watch my dog get a shot, so there's no way I could be a vet. But you, you know, and, and I have two in college now, and both of them, two years before they graduated college, were going in a completely different direction that they are going in right now. So I'm not sure how they are going to do this. And once you're on a track, you know, the, tr the tracking is, is, is geared towards take these classes because, you know, you might be, um, you might be good in the service industry. So we're going to kind of track you. You know, you really don't need those math classes. So, you know, we're going to track you this way. And um, it's not easy then to switch over to another track. So they're kind of pushing away from a liberal arts kind of education more towards um, this, this workforce skills. That's what they, that's what they are. Competencies are workforce skills, okay, incorporated in. And they're more about your attitudes, your behaviors, your values, and um, they're called soft skills. They're not academic. They're, and I, I go back to my question, how does this make a child smarter? We have a 65% remediation rate in this state which is appalling, which every person, every reporter should be asking our governor, what are you doing about a 65% remediation rate? That means when ki kids graduate from high school and go on to college, 65% of them are going into remedial classes. Remedial classes are generally K through eight. 65% reading, uh, I'm sorry, writing and math. Hmm. Now, all that little appendix with the grammar, Back in the back of that new Common Core aligned English textbook, maybe grammar is a little more important than just putting it in the appendix. Maybe we ought to be teaching them grammar. Maybe we should be teaching them the math facts, which you don't get with everyday math. You, you, you don't master math facts with everyday math. They're hoping somewhere along the line you get it, and maybe if you're lucky you have a school that's filling that in. But the everyday math does not focus on mastering basic math facts. Wonder why we need 65, 60, or why, wonder why 65% are going to remedial classes. There's your answer. And I've got mathematicians around the country screaming about this. That's fuzzy math. That's reform math. It doesn't teach you, everyday math doesn't even teach you the standard long division algorithm. The way you learned it, the long division, they don't teach that. There's different ways to do it now. There's, you, your kids will learn three, four different ways to uh, multiply and divide. You wonder why it doesn't get sunk in their head? When I teach algebra to kids, and I'm teaching them a concept, and I know, gosh, they're not really getting this. I can see it on their face. I think twice before introducing a second way, because I know how confusing just adding a second way. These kids are learning three and four different ways, and complicated and tiresome ways of multiplying three-digit numbers. I mean, it's crazy. When I looked at this, I was like, there's no way I would do this. No way to my kids. My daughter was in sixth grade. I showed her an example of the lattice mat method, if you're familiar with that. And my daughter at sixth grade said, Mom, why are they trying to confuse kids? If a sixth grader can look at that and say that, why can't the adults <coughs> realize how detrimental this math program is? That's where they're missing. They're not looking at this curriculum and saying, oh, this is a curriculum that you inquire your way through. I don't know a child who can inquire their way through math. Did, you, did your doctor inquire their way through medical school? I don't want that doctor. I don't. I don't. Teach my doctor. Teach him. You know, I don't want him figure, trying to figure out how time consuming is that. So that's what we have to face. And that's what we're missing through all of this. So, so the competencies, and I want to give you an example of um, where competency-based education went awry. I live in Bedford, and um, I'll take a drink of water. Oh, they love me in Bedford. Oh, they do. No, they're, 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 they're not a bad bunch up there, uh, or down there. Um, they're, they're good people. But uh, we had an issue with competency-based education a couple years ago. Um, we have a personal finance class. Personal finance was a requirement to graduate high school. And so, what do you think of personal finance? Teach the kids how to balance a checkbook, compound interest, simple interest, skills, finance skills. Well, I had a parent come to me one day and, and say, um, 
you know, my, my son was required to read this nickel and dime book. Never heard of it before. And I said, really? And she said, and she was a Christian. And she said, well, within the book, it's really offensive to Jesus. And I'm like, wait a minute, your, your kid's in a personal finance class. Why are they talking about Jesus Christ in your personal finance class? This is not a philosophy class. This isn't even a political, you know. And sure enough, there was an offensive passage about Jesus being a wine-guzzling vagrant or something along that line. As I began looking at the book and as I began researching it, I come to find out that the author is a socialist, Marxist, political activist who decided to write a story about how you cannot make it on minimum wage and how you know we need the government to come in and step in for us and just pushing those radical views without any kind of balance, without any kind of balance. So um, the parents ended up taking it to the school board and I mean they were interviewed on Fox News, you might have seen them. Um, this went nationwide, this went nationwide. They were interviewed a few times. And, uh, but they were concerned about the religious part of it. Now when I got up to the school board, you know, my whole problem was why is this in a personal finance class? This, you know, if you're going to discuss a, a kind of a Marxist kind of point of view, let's discuss, let's discuss Marxism, but let's introduce you know, Milton Friedman or somebody to, to counter that. Um, and so, but back to my point, this book meant a competency. And what in, in competency-based, remember, it's about changing values, attitudes, and beliefs in students. That's one of the biggest criticisms. This has been around for many, many, many years, tried in different states, different school districts, but guess what? It's new and innovative in, in New Hampshire. That's how it's being sold. But as you this was a pro So when this came about, even though a lot of people were upset this book was in the school, I was happy because I thought, oh, this is perfect. Now I can take this on the road. I can tell people, here's, here's exactly what this does. Just same with the IRS and, and the, um, you know, the, the big scandal with that. I can point to it and say, here's the example. This is how they use this. If you go to the Department of Education's website and you look at their competency-based education, you're going to see algebra competencies, you're going to see academic competencies, then you're going to see these other competencies that have nothing to do with academics. Okay? And speaking of the algebra competencies, so what I did was because I have access to math professors, I decided to get the competencies for Algebra 1 and send it to Professor uh, Stephen Wilson on Johns Hopkins, the guy from Fordham. And I said, could you look at Rochester's? Can you look at Litchfield's? Can you look at Bedford? And can you look at what is on the Department of Education's website? And look at their competencies, look at their Algebra 1 competencies and tell me what you think. They're horrible. Uh, he, he did give a good, he, he kind of gave a thumbs up to Bedford. Bedford's were pretty good. The Department of Education's, he's the, you know, uh, terms that they're weak. They're, he, I wrote an article about it. You can actually go, um, go to the Bedford patch. If you, if, you, if you go online and you click on Bedford patch and you put my name in there, Anne-Marie Banfield, it will bring up the articles that I've written on Common Core and on this competency-based education, and you can read word for word what he said, because I put it within the, that article. I didn't alter it. Everything he says, he, he, he wrote. So you can read what he says about the Rochester Algebra 1 competencies. So even when, so when your school says, you know, you know we're using competencies, and you know, we're, we're worried about the outcomes of your kids, and you know, keep that in mind, that some of these are non-academic, and even the ones that are academic could be seriously flawed. For instance, in Litchfield, their algebra competencies are based on their Algebra 1 textbook, one of the worst algebra textbooks out there that you can use, and he points that out. He said, now you have flawed competencies based on a flawed textbook. So are your kids going to learn quality Algebra 1 through competency-based education? No. No. Because that's not really, unfortunately, how it's been implemented. Maybe the people who dreamt up this idea had a different thing, but it, every state that it's been in, it's been a problem. Governor McDonnell uh, from Virginia was here several years ago, and I had an opportunity to speak to him, and I, and I asked him about it. I said, you had outcome-based education in your state. He's like, yeah, we got rid of it. It, you know, it doesn't make kids smarter. You, it, how long has it been in your school? Have you seen test scores rise? Is this really making the kids smarter? I mean, I have yet to see any kind of evidence it's been in bed for, for several years. Where's the evidence that this is working? So um, 
all, is, is what I'm basically getting to is all of this is ignoring the fundamental problem, which is, again, we have a 65% remediation. That's pointing to your K through 8 education system, which means they're not learning the math acts, they're not learning basic grammar, they're not learning probably quality science in, in, in your schools. So that's what, that's what we're missing, and that's where the focus needs to be. Um, Common Core has never been field tested. Um, how could we have done this differently? Well, we could have done what Texas did. Texas said, no, we're not doing this. And what Texas did is they called up Sandra Stotsky and said, come on down here and fix our state standards. She goes down there, and what do they do? They take the standards that they had in place and work to improve them. So now they have some of the best standards in the country. So when they tell you that with Common Core, if your child goes from New Hampshire to another state, well, now they're, you know, everything should be pretty much the same. No, because you know what? Several states are now thinking about pulling out. Indiana, who signed on early, is now going, wait a minute, we had some of the best standards in the country. We lowered ours. Governor Pence just put the brakes on it in Indiana. Uh, Michigan, they just voted to defund it. They're already moving. They're already moving towards saying, maybe this wasn't such a good idea. Let's get rid of this and let's improve our standards. And that's what they did in Texas. So, yeah, your child may move to another state and be on par if they happen to move to a Common Core state. But if they move to a state where, you know, that they've improved their standards, your kids are going to be behind. And that's another thing that they're not telling you. Because I've gone to several informative sessions with our Department of Education. I've listened to them sell this to school boards. I've listened to them sell this to legislators. And what's remarkable is when they sell it and when they tell people this is what Common Core is, you never hear any of this. You never hear the word Sandra Stotsky, her name come up. You never hear Professor James Milgram, his name come up. They will tell you that this is going to help teach your kids how to think critically. Really? Because to me, you better have a foundation to think critically. And if this teaches your kids to think critically, why are they not presenting any critical information when they make these presentations before the school board? Maybe they need to learn how to think critically because their presentations do not offer any kind of critical analysis of Common Core. Um, how was this all started? Um, which I probably should have done this at the beginning. Uh, this was, see, there was such a lack of transparency with this that it's, it was hard to get this information, too. Um, Achieve is an organization uh, and kind of a progressive organization out there, and they were the ones who kind of thought, you know, this is a good idea. Um, but again, this was in the planning stage years and years ago by the gentleman at the name of Mark Tucker, who is actually the guy who came into New Hampshire with this competency-based education. He's the, if you Google the word Mark Tucker, and that's with a C, and you Google Mark Tucker letter to Hillary Clinton when they were in office, he spells out exactly his plan for your kids, and it's now in New Hampshire schools. Cradle to grave, I don't know if you remember that term. This is, this is a Mark Tucker. Just go and Google letter to Hillary Clinton. He's going to take care of your kids all the way through college, and he's going to track them, and he's going to say, you know what, maybe, maybe college is for your kid, maybe not. Maybe career, maybe the service industry, or maybe something over here. I mean, that's, that's the goal of this. That's the ultimate goal, tracking one way or another. Um, so the uh, National Governors Association, which is a trade organization, you can't get any information from, from these organizations. These are not public, public um, entities where you can go and do a uh, you know, freedom of information request. So the National Governors Association and the, Chief, and the Council of Chief State School Officers were essentially the two organizations that came together. They're, they're lobbying organizations. Okay? Um, I think a lot of the governors probably thought, hey, this is a way to put us on an even, you know, now we're going to all be judged at the same level. Well, yeah, but, you know, that, that, that was lowered. The standards were lowered for many states. Um, again, this was not voted in by the legislature. This is not, they're, they're saying that this is state-led. The people didn't vote for this. This is not state-led. 
This is by trade organizations at the top, national effort. Um, I'm just about done, because <laughs> I'm looking thick and Bruins are going to start soon. Um, <laughs> is there a way to stop this? Sure, absolutely. You got to bang on the doors of your state legislators, your representatives, your senators. What district am I in? Who's your se senator here? Cataldo. Cataldo? Okay. Who? Okay, okay. Um, keep calling. Keep writing him. Make sure that he's on board. I'm not sure where he's at on this. Uh, definitely talk to the senators because we almost got some legislation passed, uh, not, this, not with this new legislation, legislators, but with the old one. We got something through the House that said, let the legislators vote on this, and it got stuck in the Senate, and it got tabled in the Senate before this new, um, what do you call it, the class of legislators came in. We need to get that back. And like I said, there's, I think there's some privacy laws that you're going to see next year, which will be important to support those. We need to get rid of this. So, so contact your state senators, who, your representatives for sure, and, and edu tell them, you need to educate yourself on this. We need to get rid of this. Go back to the standards that we had in place and improve on them. I'm sorry that this governor has not made it a priority, but the people need to tell her to make it a priority. The past governor did not. He handed it over, completely said, you know, this should, be his, this should have been his responsibility, and he shifted it upwards. Now it's your responsibility. Who do you go to if you want to change these standards? Anybody know? I don't know. I have no idea. Who do you lobby? I don't know. They're copyrighted. So this, these are not New Hampshire standards. The gov federal government said we can only adjust them upwards 15%. Doesn't sound like that's a local control issue to me. Oh, but they are telling you that this is voluntary. Your schools can reject this, by the way. Your schools can reject this. But here's the problem. There goes your funding for title programs and lunch programs. Yeah, they're going to make the kids who are the most neediest pay the price if your school pulls out of this. Um, the state mandated this test, this flawed test, is now mandated in your school. This is now mandated. So all of these kids are going to be judged on this test. So what do you think the school is going to do? You think they're not going to align their materials to that test? Remember the problem with no, teaching to the test? That's not going away. That's staying in put. And we just passed, well, we're in the process of passing legislation. You could ask Sam Cataldo to vote no on SB 48. That would be helpful uh, because SB 48 says that if the schools are not performing well, if the students are not performing well on this test and they're in the lower portion, the Department of Education gets to come in and remediate your school. Now, how do you think they're going to remediate it if the kids are not passing this test? Remember, this is voluntary. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do... Common Core, but the state's going to step in and what do you think they're going to push? You're not passing a Common Core test, you better buy these Common Core materials. Remember, this is supposed to be voluntary. And the teacher's evaluation to the test. The test controls everything. Get rid of the test. Get rid of the test. Um, so, so focus on your state and local officials, school board members, get them to push back uh, there's school boards up in, in Conway, I read an article not too long ago where they were saying, look, this is an unfunded mandate. You're not giving us any money to buy these materials, bring in these computers, um, t train these teachers, but you're telling us that we have to teach this test and we have to do all these things for this test. So this is, you know, look at it as, a, I consider this an unfunded mandate, and I've heard that term used at, at, in other districts too. Um, and that is against the law, by the way. 28A is the regulation against um, an unfunded mandate. So push back, push back. Um, highlight the costs. What are the costs? Get your school board to tell you what this is going to cost the school and make sure that they're being honest with you. If they're taking money out of title money to pay for the, because uh, I've got schools telling me that, well, we're just gonna, we're gonna use this title money. No, that title money is there for a reason. They're for your neediest, neediest kids. Why are you taking the money away from that? Get the costs. Um, the standards change, and they're not even quality standards. The teacher evaluation. So these are reasons to push back. Um, the Re Republican National Committee came out with a resolution opposing Common Core. So if you have any Republicans, why your Republicans 
should be looking at this resolution and understanding that the Republican committee came out against this. Um, and even the unions are now pushing back on, on, on the assessments. Uh, just a couple things I want to finish up with. Um, I'm with Cornerstone. We have a big event coming up in September. It's September 17th. It's going to be at the St. Anselm's Institute of Politics. It is going to be a common core forum. If you think you learned a lot tonight, I've just hit the tip of the iceberg. I have Sandra Stotsky coming to that event. Okay? She's going to tell you things that will probably stun you. Um, you know, she's an English expert. She sat on the validation committee. She knows the problems with this, so she will be there. Uh, Jamie Gass from the um, Pioneer Institute will be here. He is uh, in Boston. Pioneer Institute is in Massachusetts. They were very instrumental in getting the best standards in the country. So when, when Governor Patrick said, yes, we'll sign on to Common Core because we need this money, and who knows, could be for political reasons. I'm not sure why he did it. Um, they were devastated. They were devastated because they had, their students were performing at the top. They were the, doing the best in the country. They had the best standards. They just went with Common Core. Now they have a new test, and so they're devastated. So Jamie Gass was instrumental. He's going to tell you how it worked in Massachusetts. This is how we could do it in New Hampshire. Okay, just because they abandoned it doesn't mean we can't do it that way. Um, so he'll be there. Um, Emmett McGroarty will be there. And um, Emmett is the nationwide expert on Common Core and the problems with Common Core. He's my go-to guy. And I can tell you, I know a lot. He knows a whole lot more. He, um, he leads the national, he, go, he goes from state to state, legislatures testifying. He's been on Fox News, MSNBC. He was on Glenn Beck. Uh, speaking about the problems with Common Core. He will be there. We've invited him as, as a cornerstone event. It will be at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm's at 7 o'clock on September 17th. We just got everything confirmed, so please mark that on your calendar. Please come, because I can tell you, if you think you learned a lot tonight, you're going to be, when you walk away from that, there's so much more. I can be here for three hours, but I know the Bruins are on. So I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> so those three will be there. It's not going to be a debate. You're, if you want to hear the good about Common Core, go listen to the DOE. They're going to tell you things that you know, this is going to be the greatest thing for your child. Okay? Go listen to that. We don't want to waste your time. We want to tell you, here's the problems with it. Here's what you're not hearing. Okay? So it's not going to be a debate. It's just not. I, I, I said, no. I want, I want you guys to hear the news that you won't hear coming out from the proponents. Um, if you are on Facebook, look for Stop Common Core in New Hampshire and like the page because uh, we had a couple parents set that up. I constantly post on there. They, they made me when they administer, so I'm constantly posting on there as with some of the other people. So like that. Um, I think that's basically all I have to cover. I will take questions. I may not know all the answers. I will take questions. But if you have to get to the Bruins game, I don't blame you. My husband's at home watching it. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. So homeschoolers and private schools are basically in the same boat because, you know, they're kind of on the outside. So how will this impact them? Well, first of all, if I was a homeschooler or a private school, I would not follow this at all. I just would have nothing to do with this. But there's going to be some that are going to be concerned because guess what? The ACT and the SATs are now being run by one of the guys who ran the Achieve, oh, it, it, it's crazy, who ran, ran the Achieve or, or was instrumental in Achieve, he's now running in charge of the um, SATs and the ACT. So they're aligning to Common Core. Your GED now is now aligned to Common Core. That was voted in by the legislature. Um, I, I went and listened to the hearings, and people on the House Education Committee said, well, we just need to trust them. They know. They know what's best. And I'm sitting there going, mm, I don't know. I don't, I don't think this is a good idea. Um, but so, so now that the SATs and the ACTs are aligned to Common Core, you've got a lot of private schools and homeschoolers saying, my kid's got to pass that test to get into college. Um, should I be using Common Core aligned material to help prepare them for that test? So that's another reason we really need to push back. It's really going to start impacting the private schools. I, uh, th there's a real pushback in Indiana right now, and it's by moms. Um, and their kids are in the Catholic schools. And they have a voucher program in Indiana. 
And the voucher says that in order for your kids to go to any kind of school using this voucher, they, your, those kids have to take the standardized test. So now all the Catholic schools are moving to Common Core because their kids have to take the test. We had just passed a bill last, uh, couple, well, was it, not last year, the year before, opening up school choice for, for kids, and I supported it. But it's not a voucher program. Because I was, when they came to me and said, would you support, you know, would you support this school choice program? I looked at it, and I thought long and hard, because I thought, vouchers come with strings attached. And this is one of the problems. And I'm all for school choice. I love the idea of a voucher program, but now I see the problem in Indiana where they're making those kids take the test. If, if they take a voucher to a school, that school makes those kids take the test. Um, and you know the problem with the test. But luckily, our school choice program, and if, that ever, if they ever try to, tra to attach a string to that, we've got to say no strings attached like that, because now you see the problem. But, that's, that's the problem. It's the, the homeschoolers and the private schools are concerned about the test that, that these kids will be taking. They're aligning, um, you know, college, they're, the college, the, the test to get into college. So um, this is concerning. I mean, we're already starting to see books enter the homeschool community with Common Core aligned material in them. Doesn't mean you, you don't have to take that book, you know, you can skip over it. Your kids should not be subjected to dumb down standards if they're not in, if if you're homeschooling them elevated like you always do if you're homeschooler elevated i would i would do it i because i still believe i know that the kids who are homeschooled i think they'll blow away the test anyway but there's you know but there's a concern there so then they're like should should we you know use these materials because they have to take this test so i think that's one of the biggest concerns right now Um, my kids have always been in Catholic schools because I moved from state to state, so I look for some kind of uniformity. Um, my kids have always taken uh, like the Terra Novas and the California uh, Achievement Test. Um, and I had no problem with it because they weren't ever teaching to the test. It's just, you know, it's, I'm not opposed to test, you know, it's a good quality test. Her question was, can, can your kids avoid taking the test? If my kids were in a public school, I would die before I let them take a standardized test. I would never, ever let my kids sit for a standardized test. That's the truth. You decide what's best for your kids. I'm not here to tell you what's, what to do with your kids, but mine would never sit for one because I don't trust what they're collecting. I don't trust if they're, if they're telling me they're proficient in it. Now, I would take my kids and I would have them tested outside the school system because I want to know where they're at. I'm not opposed to tests. I have an issue with the, t the assessment. Let me back up. These are called assessments. They're not tests. A test will test your child for academic knowledge, okay? So if you want to test your kids outside the public school system, look for something that says test because now they're looking for academic knowledge. If it's an assessment, Mm. Now they want to know, what, do you have the right attitude? Do you have the right beliefs? So keep that in mind. That's the difference between a test and an ass assessment. And notice how we we're using assessments now. Um, and I've got more information on that that I could certainly share with anybody if they really want to look at it. Boy, this, this assessment system, I, I just don't have any, any faith or trust in it. I don't. And so can you opt your kids out? Uh, I would say that they're probably going to give you a hard time because, you know, the government's telling them that these kids have to take this test. And I know people, oh, but parents across the country are saying no. They're, they're fighting back. They're not letting their kids sit. And they're collecting information on them. Um, it's not even something that is of quality. Why? Now, interestingly enough, I went through the Board of Education. They just came out with a bunch of rules. And the first version had the assessment that that would be on your child's record when they graduated. So I was reading this thinking, uh-oh, if you have to take this in order to graduate, I was going to go fight that with the Board of Education because I thought, no, it. But the second set of rules that they came out with, I think they took that language out. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, as far as I know, no, they, they, they cannot force your kids to take this. But again, a lot of this stuff is starting to come out. So, you know, we haven't had the, the, the testing here yet, so I don't know what they're going to 
say once it comes into the school. As far as I know, no, your kids do not have to take it. And many parents in other states are saying, no, my kids are not sitting for this. Yep. Yes. Okay. So, where do you know where we stand as a state compared to the other states as far as our education? Compared, like comparatively? Yes. Um, other states, this is the interesting thing. For years, I've been looking for that number. I've been looking because other states report this. Uh, I saw a few years ago that Kentucky was reporting 20%. And I saw the Commissioner of Education at a meeting one day, and I walked up to her and I said, where is this information? Because to me, this is critical. This is probably the most important pieces of information a parent should have in their pocket. How many of your kids are graduating from high school and going into remedial classes? That's something that your school board could be asking. As your graduates, as your kids graduate, why aren't they surveying those kids? It doesn't have to be personal information. Just tell me whether you had to go into a, a remedial class. We're going to report the percentages to parents. Wouldn't that be an eye opener for your school? We do have school board members that would do that. But anyway, back to your question. Um, so, so some schools have reported that, or some states have reported that. It's all over the board. But 20% was a high figure. And I walked up to the Commissioner of Education. I said, do you have, this was a couple years ago, do you have this, this piece of data? Do you have this information? And she said, no. And I said, well, I think it's important to get because Kentucky's reporting 20% of their kids are going into remedial classes. Oh, no, no, not our students. 65% is what the National Telegraph reported. And I've been raising the alarm bells with parents. Why is this going? I mean, this, to me, if I was a reporter working for MUR, I would be asking, what, what, what happened? What happened here, and what are you doing to fix this? Because when Governor Hassan campaigned, one thing I noticed is she said that she was going to raise the standards in, in, in the state. <laughs> I have not seen any effort by this governor to do that. So this should be a question every person should be asking our governor, 65%. And do you think, because the, as I can tell you, that Professor Milgram and Professor Stotsky said the remediation rate will not improve with these standards. Now, you know, will it go down or up slightly? Possibly. Well, as uh, here at Homeschool Law, yep. the law has changed in recent years of what the standard is. But when I was shocked when I first started homeschooling to find out that in order for your child to pass, they had to be in the 40th percentile in New Hampshire to go on to the next grade level. So that ought to give us a clue that if we're requiring homeschool, we right. only meet Oh, your bar's way up here, by the way. But, it, yeah. but we're only meeting the 40th percentile in order to advance from third to fourth grade. Well, that's probably what they're doing in the schools. Well, it's pretty scary. Right, right, right. And, and yeah, I know I'm not going to go in that direction because I will be here too long. But. Um, it, it's an absolute, I'm just shocked by the number. I'm shocked that this hasn't made the news. I'm shocked that people are not in up in arms because I've seen to be the only one, although there are, other, there are other legislators very concerned about that. But this is a key factor. This is a key factor. Uh, we had a, uh, one of the legislators introduce legislation that said if your kids go into remedial class, the school ought to pay for it. Voted right out of committee. They won't. Pay. <laughs> no, they won't have any part of that because that takes money away from your school. And we can't have that, you know. And I thought, are you kidding me? They failed that student. They failed that student in many ways. I mean, these are the kids going into college. What about the kids who didn't go to college? How many of them? I mean, is the percentage higher? I, I would suspect it's at least 65%, if not higher, if your kids don't go to college. Yep. Well, I think that, you know, I think the teachers are, I'm getting kind of some mixed reactions. Uh, I talked to um, a reporter at, at HPR, he was doing a story on this, and I asked him, what are, what are the teachers saying? And he said, well, there's some that are dead set against it, and then there's some that are kind of like, oh, here's a no child left behind, we have to go through the motions, and, you know, there'll be another one down the road. And then there's some teachers who really think that this is a great idea. 
And I said, yeah, because the tests haven't been coming out yet. Because in New York, they're up in arms. The teachers are up in arms. Because what happened is all the kids taking the test, now the proficiency levels have gone down, and the teachers are tied to those, to those tests now. How does what? The parents um, well, I think you have a problem because I will be honest with you, for a teacher to speak out publicly, they're putting their job on the line, they're putting their neck on the line. Um, I was on a conference call with a teacher out of Wyoming the other night, and uh, she was all gung-ho for, for Common Core. Gung-ho. And then she started researching it, completely flipped. Completely flipped. When she started looking at this, she was like, oh, this is not good. I, I was completely wrong. She went to her administrator and sat down with the administrator. And the administrator's like, well, it looks like we're going to have to agree to disagree because, you know, this is what I got to do. And, you know, they have to be a good soldier and, you know, say that they like it and things like that. And so she went to meetings with the teachers and began speaking about what she found. Do not speak about this. And I can't, I, I have teachers on my email list in New Hampshire who feed me information and I will never reveal their name. Never. Because if I do, their job is on the line. Their job is on the line and I get such good information that I would, you know, I, I just respect their privacy and I understand these people have to feed their family and they cannot speak publicly. So can you get to the teachers? Sure, but are you going to find a teacher willing to speak publicly? I mean, I've got a couple that will. But um, the majority are just going to go along because that's, that's what we've set up. We've set up a system where teachers cannot be honest with you about everyday math. They can't be honest with you about this. Yep. Thank you. Uh, is, is it proper to be the local school board, or do we really need to be at the state level for this? I would say the priority is the state, but do not stop there. Yes, absolutely go to your local school board and start pounding fists and, and you know, and say, no, no, this is, how much does this cost? I'm surprised that the school boards aren't being a little more vocal, because the ones in Conway, they are. They're saying, wait a second, look at what this is going to cost us. And this is an unfunded mandate, so I'm kind of surprised. They're, but, you know, a lot of our school boards have kind of turned into rubber stamps. It's really kind of depressing. And so, to, you know, if you've been a good school board member, your school board should not be rubber stamps. They're the overseers. They're the ones who should be the eyes and ears for the parents out there and saying, and challenging. And it doesn't mean that it has to be a battle. It just means challenge. When they come, don't just say, oh, that, wow, that looks really good. Yes, mm -hmm. rubber stamp, rubber stamp, rubber stamp. No, they should be asking questions, and, and especially in the public eye, in the school board meetings, because I have a lot of them say, well, you might ask a lot of questions, but it's not at a school board meeting. No, you need to do it publicly so, so the people of the town can hear those questions. And you need to be questioning this stuff and taking your time and researching this um, and really challenging the district because if no child left behind didn't really, I mean, gave us a 65% remediation rate, how do you trust what the same people are going to fix it? You know, and by the way, no child left behind was voted in by our Congress, our Senate, and signed into law by the President. Now, I don't support no child left behind, but it was voted in by the people. Common Core has never been voted in on the federal level. They just went around. They just went around the legislature. The, the waiver went around the legislature, the No Child Left Behind waiver that we are now going to get because we basically sold our soul for Common Core. Oh, you know what the guy in the back was? Can you give us a few more examples of the, the data that they're collecting? Um, it, there's a 400 point data system, and, and if you Google that, you might be able to pick it, find it. If you can't, let me know because um, I've got it as a file. Do you have that too? Okay, so she has it as a file. And yeah, I, I would suggest going through that. It comes from the Department of Education website. This is not something that, you know, I came up off with the top of my head. Um, but, you know, all kinds of things. Race, religion. I mean, do you remember? I mean, now off the top of my head, I'm thinking. Uh, how many books do you have in the house? Yeah. Sure. Do you have Yeah, stuff you're like, why are they asking these questions? 
Uh, I didn't see any question or data on guns, did you? I don't think I saw that. No, I haven't seen that yet, but that's on the Obamacare. That's what I heard, that's what the doctor's being about. But I'm going to be surprised that gets added. Yep. Any pointers on how to engage our school board? Because, like, I live in Rochester, and people go to the school board meetings, they will present valid points, they'll pretend to listen, and it dies right there. Yeah. How do we force these people to respond? You I vote them out, you vote somebody like yourself in. Or you run for it, I should say. <laughs> you, you, you remove them. Because if, if they are not responding, if they're not doing what they should be doing, they are the overseers of your school. Now I will tell you this, Mark Tucker, the guy that I brought up earlier who came to New Hampshire to redesign the school, guess what he wants to do? Eliminate your school board. His, part of his goal is to eliminate local control. He says it. I'm not making this up. He, he, he wrote a piece saying that he wants, and some of the, there's legislation in Illinois to eliminate local school boards, by the way. So if you think that this isn't going to happen, they've already eliminated them in, in New York. So if you don't think that this can happen, take away your only voice. And yeah, it's sad because some of these school boards are not real, but you've got to get good school board members on there, honestly. And you've got to get the ones who are willing to stand up and, and, and challenge. Not the ones that say, mm, you know, kind of just shake their head. You've got to get them to challenge. It makes your school better. It's going to make it better because you're going to challenge these administrators to elevate things. So it's, you know, you shouldn't look at it as a way of, of a, you know, like a battle. It's, it's, you know, I get challenged on this stuff. I'm the I don't get paid up. I get challenged. And you know what? It, it, it makes me go out and it makes me do more research and ask more questions and get more information. So when I come to you, I can better ask you, answer your questions. So challenging is not a bad thing. And too often we see our school boards that don't challenge anymore. And that's, so if you see school board members that are like that, Start getting better people on the school board because those are the people that you should have serving you. I mean, that, that makes the school better. Federal bureaucrats are going to be taking care of getting rid of the state and the local courts. I mean, that's the whole thing. The whole thing? Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned um, the everyday map. Is that the same as map and focus? Because in our community in Dover, they are touting math and focus, and we have actually had teachers get up at meetings saying, we are gladly teaching Common Core. We absolutely are teaching Common Core to the kids. And when I went in and I looked at math and focus, which they also call Singapore math, yeah. and you, there's a place on the, I think it's the Holt Mifflin site that creates that software. You can go in and type in your zip code, and it will list every school entity that's affiliated with that, which is Common Core connected yep. and it lists every private school, every daycare, every public school, every school entity on there. And so are we talking about the same thing, everyday math, same thing as math? Everyday is? math is fuzzy math. Um, and the best way to describe it is like a discovery. It's a discovery inquiry math. And they teach you, like I said, multiple ways to do algorithms, uh, multiple algorithms. Um, Singapore math, and, and I'm, I'm relaying this information. I've looked at everyday math. I have not looked at Singapore math. Um, so the information I'm going to give you comes from the mathematicians. So this, is, so this is the good part, because they've looked at these textbooks. And Singapore, Singapore, the country, their students are, are like top in, in, in the nation, or in the, in the world. Um, so they kind of want to model that. So they took the Singapore kind of model and they developed a textbook curriculum based on that. In general, I would say Singapore is probably one of the best math programs out there. But, now just to throw you a wrench in it, um, okay, so this was, you know, five years ago, I would say, yes, Singapore is the best math program out there, along with Saxon. If you're homeschooling, I'm sure you're familiar with Saxon math. Because these are some of the better, that, you know, you're gonna get the basics. Um, but as they start aligning to Common Core, uh, my concern, and I haven't looked at, you know, and I haven't gotten any feedback yet on, on Singapore, but I've heard that Singapore is starting to move towards, towards Common Core. Will that water that addition down? So, so now it's like, I can tell you, yes, Singapore is the best math program out there, but you, 
got to really look at um, the addition. And you have to see, you know, is it the older addition? Because some of the older ones are, are some of the best. Even with Saxon, Saxon kind of, when they, when they sold to one of these publishers, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't as good as what, what you originally had. So uh, if I was a homeschooler, I would personally go back and get an older edition. You know, all these schools, we need to buy new, new, new. Oh, no. Go back and get that grammar book from the 1950s if you really want to teach your kid good grammar. Go back and get the arithmetic. It used to be called arithmetic. Remember that? Go back and get an arithmetic book and teach your kids arithmetic. Grammar doesn't change. Math doesn't change. Two plus two will always equal four. Why do we have to change everything about it? So, so math and focus is based on Singapore. My guess is, you know, just an educated guess with, you know, from basically what I've heard heard back from the mathematicians, is that you're probably going to make a major step up with math and focus if it's if if it's the Singapore series, which I believe it is. Uh, is it as good as what they're learning in Singapore? Probably not. And, and I'm hearing from people who lived in Singapore when they've looked at this math program, it's not as good. But when you're talking about everyday math, I mean, you know, there's a whole lot of textbooks up there that would be a step up from that program. Oh, so, I yeah. The other thing we've been hearing from parents in a number of areas is that their kids are no longer allowed to be cursive writing. Mm -hmm. They've been told can't do that, and mm -hmm. so when you think about the implications of that, yes, we had heard, I think it was just today on Glenn Beck, where he said, you know, if you don't know how to write cursive and you don't know how to read cursive, can you imagine trying to read the old deeds or the old documents? That's going to seem like high That's words. right. Is that common core as well? Is that what we're seeing? Um, you know, no, no. I would say that um, because schools, they're, they're so focused now that, that they're getting rid of other things so they can focus more on what they're going to be tested on. If you're not testing on cursive, why, why, why waste that time on cursive writing? Now, here's an interesting story. Um, my daughter went to take the SATs a few years ago. She's a sophomore in college now, going to sophomore. And, you know, she sat down to take the SATs, and the, and the uh, instructor said, everybody signed their name. And so she started signing her name, and everybody in the, cl you know, in the class was like, oh, we don't know how to write our name. <coughs> she came home, she's like, Mom! You wouldn't believe this, you know, and uh, I'm like, oh, wow. And, and I do want to bring up one more point because I, I think this is important. Uh, this competency-based education that I talked about and this real-world learning, uh, you, we don't no longer want you sitting in your seat. You can go learn this stuff out, you know, in the real world. Really, how do you do an algebra textbook in, in the real world? I mean, this is what this is being sold. This is my question. Now, my daughter went into um, the nursing program. And um, at a college in Rhode Island. And guess what? She has to sit in a seat, and she has to listen to a lecture. And she has to take notes, and she has to memorize, 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 memorize. And I just read an article the other day um, from a teacher who supports Common Core because there's not going to be any more of that rote memorization. And we want kids to think critically. Well, let me tell you something. My daughter. If she did not know how to study and memorize, would be in big trouble. 25% of the kids in that nursing program dropped out last year. And she was struggling, and she knows how to memorize, and she knows how to study. Because she went to Trinity High School, where they taught that, where they required that. She sat in her seat. And, and you know, if, if you want to take a, a you know, it's, it's a way of kind of doing away with the liberal arts again. If you, you know, if you want to take piano, and, and they want to give you credit for that, I mean, as a local community, go ahead and decide for yourself. But I've been asking the question, how do you learn chemistry in, you know, as, a, as an 11th grader in the real, how do you get through a chemistry course? You have to open up a textbook. I'm sorry, this doesn't sound like fun for all these kids. And, you know, this focus about making it fun and exciting and keeping kids in school, you're getting away from the discipline that it takes her now. And she's going into her sophomore year, and she survived that first year because that first year was critical. I mean, kids were dropping out like flies after every test. You know, i got to drop out of this program. They, they were prepared. They weren't prepared. And this is a kid that in her junior year decided to go to nursing. Up until junior year, that was never even in her radar screen. Yep. Do you feel that there's just a group of people that want uneducated citizens out there? It seems like, based on what I'm hearing, that's the goal. They want people to have no skills or abilities whatsoever. You know, I, you're asking me to get to somebody's head. 
And it's really hard to answer that question. I asked somebody one day, because um, he said that you know schools should be an avenue for social justice. And I said, at the expense of a quality education? And they said yes. They said yes. So my point back to him was, don't you get social justice when you have a child, especially in poverty, that's well educated, that graduates top of his class. It's kind of th that's how you get social justice. That's how you get true justice. Is you give these kids a quality education. You make them smarter, so they can now compete with the kid who went to Dairy Field for twenty-five thousand dollars a year. Okay, because these kids aren't going to be able to compete with them because we, you know, the kids at Dairy Field are sitting in their seats and they're learning and they're given a quality liberal arts education. And they're required to take chemistry and biology and mathematics and English and they're taught grammar at some of these elite private schools. They haven't dumbed down. You know, you look at these politicians who are passing these laws, these bureaucrats, their kids aren't gonna be in these schools. Their kids are in the elite private schools where they're paying out the wazoo, you know, so, you know, I don't know what's going on in their head. I can't say, tell you. But I'm telling you, there, there's a lot of people out there, when I first started looking at this, I call them the anti-knowledge reformers. Anti-knowledge. Because everything they promote has nothing to do with making a child smarter. How do you get to medical school? How are these kids going to get to these jobs, to these high-quality jobs, if you do not give them the writing skills, the fundamentals? And they're telling you they're giving their writing skills. Oh, they're going to prove their writing. Really? I mean, I went to public schools, and I got a pretty decent education. Okay. And when my kids were in Catholic schools, and they were learning some grammar in seventh grade that I had never heard of. I would never heard of some of these terms, and I said, I don't even know what they are. And my daughter, you know, she's taken 25 sentences. She has to find these, you know, some of these terms, some of these grammar terms. And I'm going... I can't help you because I never learned that. I never learned grammar, you know, like that. I mean, I was an adjective ever, you know, the, <laughs> the basic. But there's more to grammar, and, and, and these kids aren't learning it. They're not learning it. So how do you write? I mean, it sounds to me like it's going more towards dictatorship or whether or not they're, they're mm -hmm. Well, I don't see a whole lot of local control in any of this. Yeah. I think if we call it like what it is, it's making little activists. That's what they want. They want. That's they been one want, of my criticisms. Yes. My nephew um, and I've been asked by my sister at this point not to say what school he goes yes, to. Don't. Um, he was given an assignment yep. in seventh grade, and his assignment was: um, Do you believe that other people should be allowed to ban a book? to be able to tell you, you can't read this book because we don't think that it is um, appropriate for you to read. So for his assignment, this is what he was given. Out of 464 books that have been challenged by the Office for Intellectual Freedom, we want you to tell us what you think about these books, and they listed 20 of these banned books to a seventh grade 13 year old boy. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the titles are Captain Underpants by Rav Pilkey. I know it well. <laughs> the reasons for it being banned is offensive language. Mm -hmm. Another book listed. Um, the Absolutely True Diary of Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexey. Reasons for being banned, offensive language, racism, sexually explicit, unsuitable for age group. 13 Reasons Why by Jay Asher. Reasons, drugs, alcohol, smoking, sexually explicit, suicide, no. unsuited for age group. Well, let me tell you what we have the now next in New Hampshire. Book, Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, oh boy, <laughs> was listed. Okay, so it basically oh, yeah. gave my thirteen-year-old nephew 
20 banned books yeah. and the reason that they're banned. Yeah. So now it this gives was his homework assignment was yeah. to voice why he thinks, whether he thinks he should be able to do right. the assignment right. and what other people. Yeah. I mean, and most kids are like, why ban books, books until they become a mother? To yeah. become a mother and father, then it's like, oh, now I know why they banned those books. And it's not a banning. It's not. There's no censorship involved because you can go out and buy it for your kid. And just because they don't put it in a school doesn't. Mean, we had we had that issue when we when we addressed nickel and dimed in Bedford, and there was another book that we brought up. And um, um, you know, you, I want to go back to your point about political activism. Absolutely. In Bedford, in order to graduate from high school, these kids have to have a, a certain amount of democracy in action hours in order to graduate from high school. So one of my, so my son, who was, um, was at Trinity at the time, and his friend lived in Bedford, so he came to me and he said, you know, um, Mrs. Banfield, can you put me in touch with, um, at this time this, this man was a candidate for, for Congress, can you put me in touch with his campaign because I need to hold a sign uh, in order to get my democracy in action hours. <laughs> and I said, do you know anything about him? Do you know what he stands for? Nope. So you're going to go hold a sign, and you're going to waste all this time holding a sign to get democracy in action hours to graduate from high school. Yep. That's what I'm going to do. That's what he did. Yes, that's what he, that's what he did. So, you know, I suggested to our curriculum superintendent, could we instead, like, tell the kids to... Read the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist Papers as part of Democracy in Action Hours. You know, wouldn't that be a good idea? Um, because I sat down with, I was working the polls one day, just as a, a volunteer, and I sat down with two, two high school seniors at Bedford, and I said, while you were in Bedford, have you ever been required to read the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence? And they're like, I said, so you wouldn't know what like the 13th Amendment is? Because they're forcing you to do this volunteer, volunteer work. <laughs> Go read the 13th Amendment, see if, if you should be forced. You know, so you know, my point was, you know, they're doing all this busy work, activist work, but they have no knowledge. My daughter um, finished a political class in um, her first year of college. She had to take you know, an elective political class, part of her nursing major. She chose a political class. And um, she's in a Catholic college, so you know she's like, "Mom, that teacher, she sounds just like you." So I said, like, "Okay, you're safe. You're safe if you come out with your opinions, right?" Um, she had to do a paper on um, an issue, and, I, and I'm just going to leave the issue out just because I don't want to make this political. But she had to do a, a, a paper on an issue, and so, so did the other students in the class. And she was like, you know, and she was kind of shocked at some of the issues that they were getting up and supporting. She's like, "But mom." They can't name the vice president. They can't name the secretary of state. My daughter knows all this stuff because she lives with me. So, um, you know, the, yeah, they can argue issues, but is it based on a foundation of knowledge of what makes America exceptional and, and why we have a republic and those kind of things? No, they, don't even, they probably couldn't even tell you that we live in a republic, let alone defend it. So they can't tell you about who the vice president is. My gosh, they're going to pick a controversial issue and they're going to defend that. But are they defending it based on the U.S. Constitution? No, it's because they feel it's the right thing to do. So that's the, yeah, yeah, I see this push towards political activism through our schools without any knowledge of, you know, because I'm a political activist, so I'm not, I'm not saying I oppose this, but what you're doing is you're putting these, these illiterate students fighting for a cause and can't really articulate it in terms of, um, you know, that really makes sense, you know, based on, you know, based on this amendment or based on, you know, the history of our country. They're just basing it because it's, you know, this is just what you feel. And, you know, I, that's why I didn't want to bring up the political issue because I'm not here to argue the political issue, but I think that you're really giving them good tools if they could, if they could argue an issue based on some solid facts and information on why, why we support this, not just because it, you know, it's, it's how I feel. Yeah. I know in Rochester, in talking about getting involved and, you know, if you wait for the elections, 
my, my kids are 27 and 31. Mm -hmm. When they were in first grade and fifth grade, um, they went to Allen School and they were um, introducing a real controversial health yep. curriculum. Yep. And I was among many, many in Rochester that were really, you know, totally against this health curriculum. Yep. And out of genuine concern for our children, some of the perverted things in there were really disturbing. And, you know, we had several meetings, all kinds of people, and they passed it anyway. However, my point of Allen School, first through fifth grade, I was the only parent, Mike Hopkins, who didn't really like me, <laughs> um, did take the time to come in and thank me for coming in to review this curriculum mm -hmm. and told me I was the only parent in that school. I've been, I've been in that show so and many it's, times. I mean, people the only need to challenge, like you yes. said, challenge, inform your friends and family, and and people need to fight for their kids because... Right, because right. you know, nobody else is going to. I always tell no. people that. Oh, by the way, we did pass legislation um, two years ago. It's HB 542. And if there's anything controversial that your child is assigned, HB 542 now allows you to replace that material. Like if your child is assigned a book that um, you find is offensive, and, and I will tell you right now, when parents challenge a book in a school, it's normally not because the parents stumbled across this book, it's normally because the child brought it to them. I have had many parents contact me they're not reading these books. It's their kids who read them and said, Mom, I'm uncomfortable with this. So keep that in mind that, you know, you're making kids uncomfortable. Um, let's start listening to the kids, you know, because they always want to make it about the, oh, the parents are this, you know, this conservative and this, this, this. No, it's oftentimes, every time I get a parent call me, it's a lot of times it's the kids. Um, but HB 542 now allows you, you know, it's at your expense, so if you pull a book out that you don't like, and I do know a parent who pulled out of everyday math, and is using his own curriculum at home, his own math textbook at home, based on 542. Went to the school and said, 542, I'm not using this. I'll buy the textbook. I'll teach my kids math at home. Don't even bother with everyday math. It's my kids. Yeah, so, so use that, that law. Uh, now, the superintendent or the school has to agree to it. So it's got to be a mutual agreement. And I haven't had any issues where... Uh, you know, because honestly, it's, it's a law, and I think in general, you have administrators that really don't want to be so confrontational. They're willing to work with parents. You know, I'm sure you're going to come across some that will, you know, kind of put their fist down. But, you know, if a parent says, look, my child's uncomfortable with this book, this book isn't good, or this material isn't good, you know, we found an alternative that basically meets the same kind of criteria that you're looking for, this is what... You now have that right to do that. You know, you have to buy the book. It has to be at your expense. Um, but you have the right to do that. That is something that I support. And by the way, uh, we had a couple senators that tried to overturn that this year, and that was one of the ones that I focused on. And I said, oh, this is not going anywhere if I have anything to do with it. So I brought in a couple parents who went before the Senate Education Committee and started reading verbatim out of some of those books. Oh yeah, and they were in a state of shock of what has been given to these kids, and um, and how the parents were bullied when you know when they've challenged these books in their schools, uh, and and you know I, I wouldn't even speak it here amongst adults on the garbage that was in, in these books, and um, so that you know, Senator Lou D'Alessandro and um, Senator Susie were like two of the sponsors that tried to overturn this. And they said, well, you know, we're not seeing this in the Manchester schools. Well, let me tell you. Well, their children don't go to public schools, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So just because they didn't see it, this was in, I had one parent from Litchfield and one parent from Hollis that came in and said, and one of the parents is now on the school board. And she basically said, here's how I was treated, here's how my daughter was treated. You know, this, this law is good. Because now we don't have to sit there and fight the school, you know, to get rid of the book for the whole class. You can just replace it for my child. So if you come across that, let other people know that there's a law in place now, and um, you know, try to get the word out on it to let people know that that's that's one of the things that I went up to Concord and I supported as as a lobbyist, you know, because I, I look at it from a pro-parent perspective. So the Bruins, let's see where they're at. <laughs> Any more questions or should we wrap it up? I
very much. I do have a final comment I have to ask. What disturbs me about this is this is all about federal control of our children, of our state, of our individual lives. And what disturbs me is who oversights the grants that come in? I mean, is anybody looking at it? It seems like we're always oh, yes, attacking I am. this. We're always attacking this after it came in. Oh, yes, Who I am. let it in? Thank you for bringing that up. Let me just make this point really clear. Competency, go back to competency-based education. There's a grant foundation. It's called the Nellie May Foundation. They basically brought in a grant to the state. It introduced um, uh, competency-based education, big supporter. So I went and researched Nellie May. They're out of Brown University, Annenberg Institute. Anybody ever hear of Annenberg? Okay. Annenberg Yes, so Annenberg. And so I went and researched in LMA and I found this file, How to Reform Schools Through Community Organizing. That's their focus. Their focus, back to political organizers, that's their focus. Their focus is to make children into community organizers and political activists. That's their focus. They're the ones who are now bringing money into the state, the Department of Education. Uh, they had a meeting recently, about two months ago, they had a speaker, head of the Nellie May Foundation, come and speak to our legislators. And we're getting the head of the Nellie May Foundation in here. Let me tell you something. You ask your school, are you getting any money from the Nellie May Foundation? I will send you the file. They, they cite Saul Alinsky in their materials. That, that, uh, the only thing I wanted to say in this assembly. If you haven't read Rules for Radicals, it is an essential, absolutely essential read because not that you want to follow these rules for radicals, but you need to understand and be able to spot it yes. when it's being played yes. on this society. Yes. And in love, you need to be able to counteract yes. those with intelligence, with reason, with principles based on the Constitution. Yeah. And they're coming into our schools. Uh, New Hampshire Listens, are you familiar, familiar with New Hampshire Listens? Well, the fact that I'm on the Regional Planning Commission, yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, New Hampshire Listens goes from town to town, and they, and they use the Delphi technique, if you're familiar with that, where they have a predetermined outcome, and they come listen to you, they break you up into groups because they don't want you know a big forum like this where you know there's questions and you're challenging these people. Um, but they you know they're already in the Manchester schools, they're in the Pittsfield schools. Um, they came to uh, Winnesquam and you know put on this community forum thing, and they're already in with the teachers. They're already doing doing things with the teachers from Brown University, Annenberg. These are all associated with each other, and they're coming in and teaching the teachers and. They're coming into your schools. You've got to be able to recognize it and start asking them questions, asking your school questions. Why are these people coming in? What are they teaching the teachers? Oh, by the way, your teachers are now facilitators. They're no longer instructors. That's a part of that's part of this redesign effort. They're going to make them into facilitators. The kids are going to kind of teach each other. Group projects, collectivism. Oh, wait a second. Did I say that word, collectivism? They're no longer you know, individuals, so we're going to you know, put them into this group kind of mentality, and um, the teacher's going to facilitate the learning. Well, let me tell you something. I'm a math tutor. There's no facilitating math. No. You wonder why our kids are at 65% remediation. You need a good math teacher teaching math, teaching grammar, teaching science. Not to say that in all classes, you know, I'm not here to micromanage a teacher's class. If that's working for a class and a teacher can see, you can see real results in a specific field or a specific project, good for them. I, you know, I'm not here to, to, but I'm just saying, I've got studies that show that when this is done in a math class, for instance, it actually puts students behind. So, yep. so the, the magnet school, Maple Street, we realize that's being followed all across the country. Rochester, Maple Street School, the Mag Magnet School. I'm not familiar with it at all. Well, it's uh, unique in that, I mean, you, you really can't find out that much information except that the students are drawn from a pool. It's got, I believe, they teach two languages. It's, I think, kindergarten, I'm not positive, but uh, elementary. 
Um, I believe they're going to go longer days. I, I was talking to someone that lives near me whose child goes there, and it sounds like it's probably all common poor. Is it a public? It's a public school. Right? It's, it's Rochester. Public, it's Maple yeah. Street School, which has now been. I mean, they can do to things a, a little school. different when there are charters. I mean, there's some things that they don't have to follow, but if they're taking the test, they're taking the test. Yep. I'm a Rochester school board member, and, uh, <laughs> and the magnet school is 200 days. They teach them French, but they're not learning French. They're not even grading. It's just. Somebody comes in and it's like, okay, that's the refrigerator, those are the stairs, that's, they, they can't read French, they can't write French. Because so, they're totally not focusing they're on not grammar, focused on spelling. Anything. They're not focused on nothing. Yeah. I voted against it. And I voted against mine. 50% of the charter schools, 50% of the charter schools fail. Yeah. Because they adopt a lot of the failures that you see in the public schools. So is it a magnet school, a charter school? No. I don't think so. Right. Exactly. But I can tell you there's private schools that I would put my kids in, right. and they charge $20,000 a year. It's an experiment. It's an experiment. And we won't know for five years and 30 and learning. Right, right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I, 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 I can tell you, there's, there, I've pulled my kids out of some Catholic schools. So they're not all, yeah. Why can't we back and say education does not belong as a national agenda? Why can't we put some money just saying, stay out and this is what we're going to do? Here. Because there's a lot of people in Concord that think they know better than you. There's a lot of people who have a lot of trust in the government and have no trust in you. Yes. It's one of the reasons why when, you know, I love living in New Hampshire when the presidential candidates come, because one of my questions is, do you believe in abolishing the U.S. Department of Education? It's a question I ask of everybody. And you can, I can't tell you how many of the Republicans are like, well, you know, we just need to reform it. I uh, know. I uh, know. You need to get rid of the money sucker that's taking money away from our teachers and our schools. Because the, the amount of money that they spend is staggering. At the, at the national level. I, I, I don't see why. We have a state. We have a local school district. Why do we need them at the top? I mean, well, their plan requires that. Yes, that it does. I understand their plan yes. is all being played out in every little part is very important. Mm -hmm. And people don't want to involve it politically, but it's totally political, so you can't. Exactly. Yeah. And you see everybody, as I was talking to somebody today, and, and I was like, you know, she's talking about a, a family member who, you know, I think everybody's under agreement that No Child Left Behind didn't really do anything to help us, education-wise. Okay, if it was a failure, then why are we doing this again? Why are we trying it again at the federal level? Give it back to the parents, and let's see how well they do it. Well, that's but, why they left the parents out. Yes. Nothing in there about the parents, so they learned. You know how to be successful at excluding the parents is through Common Core, apparently, and that must be what you know differs from No Child Left Behind. Parents were involved. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. Especially school board. You're the school board member here. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Appreciate it.